I'm Giles Dobson, I'm the managing partner of the Rural Division of Big Wells, and hopefully the vast majority of you on the call will know me in some way, shape or form. But my role today is not to speak, it's simply to introduce the two speakers and then shut up and take questions. So this afternoon we've got Roland Bull talking about environmental net gain and Andy Turnbull talking about rewilding, both of which subjects are going to become increasingly important in the brave new world we're about to enter. Roland is a partner in our Cambridge team and he heads up our rural investment team across the whole of England. Andy is a partner in the forestry team in our Scottish Perth office and he'll hopefully bring a new and interesting perspective on what rewilding's meant in Scotland and what that then might mean for us south of the border. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a question and answer panel and please do use it. We're trying to encourage as many questions as possible and I'll pause after Roland's presentation to take questions on environmental net gain and then we'll pause again after Andy's to take more questions on rewilding and hopefully there were some more questions for both of them right at the end. So without further ado I'll hand it over to Roland who will talk about environmental net gain. Roland, thank you, over to you. Thank you Giles. Um, so yeah really it's probably worth me just uh, introducing myself a bit more. As Giles said I head up the rural investment team uh, at Bidwells so my main role is looking after uh, institutionally owned investment property for uh, principally charitable clients, Cambridge colleges. We look after 15 Oxbridge colleges, uh, the Wellcome Trust and several pension funds. Um, but having studied ecology as an undergraduate, I've always had an interest in uh, conservation work and environmental land management and um, have built up a client base of, of conservation charities, wildlife trusts and done quite a lot of work in uh, the sort of private markets for uh, environmental goods over the last several years. So that's really what I'm going to focus on talking about today, um, where there are opportunities effectively to monetize uh, environmental goods that are delivered by landowners. So uh, Andy, I think we'll go on and talk about the more sort of philanthropic side of things where, um, you know, largely I think private landowners have a greater degree of discretion in, in terms of you know, probably compromising on financial outcomes to deliver environmental gain. Whereas, as I say, certainly for, for the majority of my client base, although they are very socially and environmentally conscious landowners, uh, they uh, by necessity have to focus on, um, you know, financial outcomes too. So as I say, I I'm going to be looking at, um, you know, those sort of immediately tangible opportunities to uh, deliver uh, financial um, uh, gain from, from environmental goods. So the first thing I thought I'd talk about is the environmental land management scheme, which is, is uh, what's going to replace uh, the basic payment scheme. It's going to be the principal source of uh, agricultural subsidy in this country. Um, the, the pilot scheme is due to start uh, in 2021. Uh, that's currently the plan uh, from DEFRA and run through to 2024. And the rollout of the scheme itself should then take place from 2024 to 2027. Um, most of you will know that the basic payment scheme is already being wound down uh, with the first reductions taking place uh, in 2021 uh, and it will have been phased out entirely by 2028. So to say the environmental land management scheme will replace that in its entirety and it is based on the principle of payment for public good. Um, so we're looking at, at things like clean air, clean water, soil, biodiversity, uh, climate regulation, uh, heritage. So some of the things that we've seen historically under um, existing forms of, of government subsidised environmental scheme but in addition to that there will be a lot of you know other outcomes that uh, will be f publicly funded so say yeah based on that principle of public money for public good um, a huge part of that is is uh, all tied up with the uh, agriculture bill which is actually having its second reading in the House of Lords next week. So there is still very significant potential for that to be amended. And indeed, the bill itself provides a huge degree of discretion to DEFRA uh, around the implementation of that scheme. So th there's a lot y that we don't yet know about uh, certainly things, for example, you know, what, what the management prescriptions under that uh, regime might look like, uh, how lucrative some of those options will be. For example, um, there is certainly an expectation and something that DEFRA has very clearly stated that the uh, net value of uh, specific prescriptions should be greater than has been the case under previous regimes. It's always been an issue with participation where 
Um, previous environmental schemes have been based on income foregone and consequently they've had trouble encouraging a sufficient number of, uh, of entrants into those sort of schemes. Um, but without the constraint of, of uh, the common agricultural policy and, environment and European funding, uh, there is greater flexibility uh, for premiums to be paid for the delivery of those public goods. So as I say, there is a, there is a hope certainly from the agricultural sector that you know, some of these will uh, be reasonably lucrative. And when I say lucrative, uh, that will be a premium over potential alternative uh, forms of land use uh, in terms of income. What they certainly won't do is deliver the sort of net incomes that uh, basic payment has. So even if you were to receive the same level of gross income, which again, probably won't be the case for most, but even if you were to, there will clearly be a, a reasonably significant cost to delivery, both through um, additional costs and uh, income foregone, where you're changing uh, land use to, to deliver those environmental goods. So as I say, the net value of that subsidy will be substantially reduced from uh, its, its sort of current basic payment scheme form. Um, under the environmental land management scheme, there's going to be three tiers. Uh, the, the first tier will be based on action rather than outputs, uh, rather like the um, uh, entry level stewardship scheme uh, and some of the, well, most of the environmental schemes that are currently available. So providing those actions are undertaken and the commitments are, are, are met, then uh, the, the participants in those schemes will be paid. The, the second tier um, will be much more targeted and based on outputs rather than inputs. And there will be local targets around habitat restoration, creation, tree planting, flood attenuation, etc. And then finally, the third tier will be the delivery of uh, significant landscape scale outcomes. Uh, so, you know, much, much larger schemes tied together delivering uh, things at a, at a strategic scale. So, as I say, that's the sort of publicly funded side of things. Um, really then looking at uh, other, you know, potential forms of, of income from environmental delivery. Uh, another key area is carbon, uh, where as things stand at the moment, there are some established private markets uh, and, and the Woodland Carbon Code is the only sort of form of real accreditation that we've got at the moment, uh, but there is a market there. Um, the, the government has launched a scheme with 50 million pounds available through the Woodland Carbon Guarantee Scheme, uh, which will effectively underwrite that market. And the latest auction, uh, which took place only a few weeks ago, the value of that was just over £22 a tonne, uh, which was more than uh, had been expected. It was only around 150 acres, I understand, that um, it was actually submitted into that auction. And um, so it's not a really meaningful uh, area, but certainly the value of that carbon that has been sold um, will make a meaningful difference to the economics of those planting schemes. Um, what we are seeing elsewhere is some move towards large bilateral private contracts for carbon offsetting. So uh, large corporates, for instance, offsetting uh, their emissions internally within the UK uh, with other significant landowners. So again, sequestration function from typically tree planting, um, again, with you know, long-standing credible providers uh, who are committed to those uh, woodland schemes over the long term. So clearly, uh, if you look at the economics of, of forestry, particularly in England, and, and it's something that Andy knows a lot more about than I do, but, um, you know, it is very hard to make the economics, uh, you know, stack up for taking significant areas of land, even relatively marginal land in, in England, um, out of production. Um, and, and the, you know, just the, the entry cost for the land itself um, is such that uh, planting on a large scale is not uh, typically viable. But, you know, with the establishment of that market and, and potentially with the increasing value of carbon credits, it is something that has uh, the potential to, to make a meaningful difference to the eco economics of, of forestry in the UK. And certainly, you know, if we are to meet uh, the, the government's targets, uh, 75,000 acres a year they're targeting at the moment, which is about three times the current level of planting, uh, if we're going to get anything close to that, then something certainly does have to change. And 
again, the, the government announced in the, the budget this March, uh, 640 million for a Nature for Climate Fund, uh, which is expected partially to fund new forestry planting, but also partially to, to help finance uh, peatland restoration, which again will be delivered through, partly through the ELM scheme. So moving on from, from carbon, um, I guess the only two sort of immediate and, and really tangible opportunities to um, gain from environmental delivery and private land ownership are um, less uh, sort of, you know, immediately, um, you know, translating into, into uh, financial gain. But, but, you know, what we have actually done in, in several cases is um, contribute natural capital and, and uh, you know, other forms of environmental public good toward planning gain where you know elements of that may be incorporated into uh, local planning policy but otherwise in some cases we've actually come up with you know novel agreements where we've been able to achieve planning consents that wouldn't otherwise have been um, permissible in policy terms were it not for the fact that we're offering some form of additional public good alongside that. Uh, and I'm working on one at the moment where we, we are looking at the, the possibility of providing what might end up being several hundred acres of land for carbon sequestration, flood attenuation and biodiversity uh, to support a planning application, which will be a, a national strategic infrastructure project for uh, over a thousand acres of, of ground mounted solar. So. We're, we're working with the environment agency at the moment on that and, and if we can get their support as I say it will unlock potentially an opportunity for us to deliver a planning consent that wouldn't otherwise have been permissible in policy terms. So say so that that's another opportunity when these things can uh, deliver you know financial gain. I guess really finally for me the, the most important most tangible uh, and, and an area that we have been doing a lot of work on is biodiversity net gain. Now the concept of biodiversity net gain has stemmed from what was originally introduced uh, about five or six years ago as a pilot scheme for in, uh, biodiversity offsetting. And at the time we actually put together the, the first scheme to deliver a planning consent under the biodiversity offsetting regime. Uh, and I gave expert witness evidence at appeal uh, on, a, on a planning application in, in Essex where our role was to identify the offset site and set up all the contractual and financial structures to secure the delivery of the, of the offsite net gain. So really interesting um, experience and that has actually led to a significant amount of work that we're now doing uh, in terms of private deals for biodiversity net gain. So I, I'm working on several schemes at the moment for you know, very large developments, including working with uh, Marshalls on the Cambridge airport proposals where we're looking at delivering uh, not just biodiversity net gain but green infrastructure really in its broadest sense so uh, public amenity as well as uh, some of those other environmental goods um, some carbon sequestration function as well as as well as biodiversity um, so some really really interesting projects in that space and, and great opportunities for private landowners to monetize the provision of environmental goods the, the, the challenge for landowners historically has been, you know, I, I have always said when, that f when it was first introduced um, as the biodiversity offsetting pilot, because of the way the, the metric, DEFRA have a, a defined metric for assessing the on-site loss of biodiversity and then assessing and quantifying in numerical terms the off-site net gain. And so when that's applied, historically, there hasn't been a particular need or, or, or you know no particular offset site has been uh, necessarily better placed than any other to deliver the offsite net gain. There may be some particular physical characteristics you're looking for in order to deliver a certain habitat type but beyond that there are no uh, sort of locational constraints other than the fact that the policy uh, and, and uh, metrics will uh, effectively prioritise land in, in reasonably close proximity to the development site itself. So you know beyond that as I say historically there's been no um, incentive to deliver that on, on a particular site. Uh, however one of the key provisions of the Environment Bill is the requirement for local authorities to um, outline what 
are called nature recovery networks. So effectively, this is a process of biodiversity opportunity mapping, identifying areas of land within that local authority in a not dissimilar way to the way uh, strategic development you know, planning works through the local plan process. Representations can be made and you're looking at, um, as I say, the various characteristics of that land as to the potential it has to uh, link existing habitats um, and, and, and buffer you know, potentially, you know, or what are, might already be designated sites, particularly sensitive sites, or um, help preserve some locally important species, for example. So say now that that um, requirement is, is coming about, we are likely to see, or, or we will see, uh, areas of land that are identified then, which have, uh, are, are recognised to have greater potential for environmental delivery. And at that point, clearly depending on supply and demand there will be an opportunity for landowners potentially to deliver significant premiums over existing use value uh, if that form of environmental good is in particular demand and although very few of the local authorities have yet got you know done any work on on um establishing those nature recovery networks we're actually doing some work with various wildlife trust clients including the the local uh, Beds Council North Hans Wildlife Trust on uh, mapping out what that nature recovery network might ultimately look like. Um, and what is clear is that in some instances uh, supply of uh, particular forms of habitat or, or land capable of delivering particular forms of habitat will be constrained. And so just to give you an example, you know, these might be things like um, uh, delivering calcareous chalk grassland uh, in, in reasonable proximity to uh, the city where clearly there is going to be greater demand because of the pressure for development um, and so that opportunity for landowners where their land is otherwise constrained from an alternative use perspective so clearly uh, this uh, form of, of um, land use delivering environmental credits in this way will not compete with uh, in, a, in economic terms with, with high value strategic development um, but where it is otherwise constrained from a landscape perspective or a flood perspective or something else like that clearly this does present landowners with a real opportunity to deliver some quite significant premiums and so that is say is an area we're, we're doing quite a lot of work on now and, and see a lot of scope for going forward. So that's really me done uh, at this stage. And I don't know, I, I think Giles, you said you're gonna take some questions now. Thank you, yes, um, really interesting, genuinely, thank you. I'm gonna take Chairman's prerogative and ask the first question, if I may, and go right back to the start of your talk, which was on elms. And just almost from, a, from an estate owning perspective, what should estate owners actually be doing now? So we've got 60 or 70 professionals on the call. If you had to advise either an institutional or a private estate owner, what would you say they should be doing and taking advantage of now pre-elms okay so pre-elms um i mean i guess you know one of the challenges really is a slightly perverse thing I, I have always said to uh clients in the past that the, the more they do to uh, preserve and enhance environmental features on their land holding the the higher up the queue they will be for public funding in future and i still believe that is the case However, some aspects of uh, these public schemes and certainly the private scheme, so, so biodiversity net gain is precisely that, it is about net gain. So to the extent that you already have something of, of high environmental value, there is very little that you can deliver in the way of net gain. So unfortunately you've got this slightly perverse situation where you, you, you potentially have a disincentive to enhance um, as I say, environmental features. So really, it's important to understand what those opportunities are uh, and, and where those sources of revenue are most likely to come from so that you can take appropriate steps. And in some cases, enhancement, you know, even, even at cost, um, you know, will be entirely the right thing to do because that will, you know, you will then be better placed to, to receive funding going forward. And in other cases, um, actually, as I say, you, you, you know, in, enhancement in the short term may not be the right thing to do. Ho hopefully one day we will get to the point where um, habitat banking, which as a principle has been discussed for a long time, will become a reality, at which point you should be able to register a site and then go ahead and, and, and 
create your new form of habitat um, prior to the sale of an environmental credit. So I'm just going to quickly take a question from the panellists, so thank you very much for asking your questions. Um, one here from Andrew, given the requirements for environmental net gain to be in close proximity to the development site, do you think large scale habitat banks will be feasible to benefit from the scheme? Okay, so uh, yes is the answer. Um, we've actually already been looking at uh, potential speculative purchase uh, of, of land uh, for institutional investors where we believe it will have particular opportunity for environmental gain, uh, for biodiversity net gain in particular. Um, and again, it's where we uh, know that it will be within the uh, nature recovery network, where we know it's otherwise constrained, so we can buy it for existing use value and not pay a premium because it's got some sort of uh, development hope on it. Uh, and also where we know there's going to be a significant de demand for environmental credit because there is, is a lot of development pressure. Um, there is also a huge incentive to be delivering, and, and that's part of the purpose of the policy, to be delivering it not only to meet the Lawton principles of bigger, better and more joined up, but to be delivering at scale because of the cost efficiencies. So my expectation is what we will be doing and what we have been considering is, as I say, a, a, a speculative institutional purchase of a large uh, land holding and then a deal set up at the outset with a conservation charity where that land can effectively be drawn down it can be let on a conventional commercial agricultural tenancy from the outset and then drawn down as environmental credits uh, are sold into the market and, and um, the conservation charity can be brought in to deliver the uh, habitat creation and management. Understood. And final question for you before we move on to Andy. Thanks, Roland. So it doesn't sound like food protection is going to be included as a public good. Are you therefore worried that Elms will actually move farmers' focuses away from public goods? and away from producing food? Okay, um, so the first thing is public, uh, so uh, food production is not a public good, and that's why it's not being included as a public good. Food production is, is absolutely a private good. Um, so the question really is, uh, I, I suppose in policy terms, you know, what are the incentives to uh, favour domestic, uh, you know, food production and, and, and uh, try and, you know, ensure domestic food security. Now, historically, the uh, common agricultural policy was all formed around, um, you know, the fact that we nearly lost the Second World War and, and uh, you know, as a consequence of, of imported uh, risk to imported food. You know, if we were to have a Third World War now, we wouldn't lose it as a consequence of a lack of, of, of domestic food production. I mean, if, if you look at the supply chains in agriculture at the moment, you know, there are no tractors made in the UK. There is no fertilizer made in the UK. You know, we're so reliant on, on very complex, um, you know, multinational supply chains anyway, that, you know, our domestic agriculture would soon fall apart in that situation. I think there are other very strong arguments, both on sustainability grounds and from what we've seen recently with uh, coronavirus and, and uh, you know, imported foodstuffs um, and, and, and risks around that, there are other good reasons why we should be supporting domestic food production. But my personal belief is that we should be focusing on sustainable intensification. And there are a lot of ways we can go about um, enhancing uh, yield and, and enhancing productivity, utilizing relatively smaller areas of land, uh, covered agriculture, for example, and doing so in a very sustainable way in, in terms of water resources, carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it's important, but no, it's, in my, my view, it shouldn't be funded through uh, the ARM scheme. Great, Ronan, thank you very much indeed for that. Really interesting. And um, you are clearly the man who, with the knowledge, and you're going to be able to help a lot of clients going forwards. Um, Andrew and Sean, I've seen your questions. Thank you. I'm actually going to pass on to Andy Turnbull now, but we will come back to your questions at the end when we have a more roundtable discussion. So Andy, the screen is yours. Um, off you go. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Giles, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm actually quite excited to take part in my first ever webinar as a presenter. And um, I even had a lockdown haircut for the occasion, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to use some slides that will hopefully, uh, with some nice photos that look a lot prettier and uh, should be enjoyed a bit more than, than myself. Um, I'll just load, load that up now. So I'm going to uh, give a short short presentation on on rewilding and ask ask the question: 
is this the future for the uplands? I'll share some of my thoughts and experience from Scotland, taking a look at the recent past, the current picture, and the direction of travel, as well as the opportunities this new future may hold. So in the last few years, more and more of us have heard the term rewilding being bandied about, and most of us have a preconception of what this actually means. I have here on the screen the definition that Rewilding Britain uses, and the definition, it varies between different groups, and to some people it sounds like a utopia, and to others it feels very threatening. To me, uh, rewilding, it's an evolution of the conservation movement, which has, uh, I think it's fair to say, over the years realised that single species management doesn't always produce the desired effects, and that wider beneficial impacts may be gained by focusing on large scale ecosystem recovery. With rewilding, people, they often jump straight to thoughts of uh, big predators like uh, the wolf or the lynx, those sorts of reintroductions. However, um, I'm going to focus on a subject that's a bit closer to home, uh, which is trees, um, hopefully a bit less controversial as well. So let's take a look at what's been going on in Scotland. I think it's important to start by dispelling some myths about the Scottish uplands. When many people imagine Scotland, uh, they picture something like this, expansive, wide open views, the hills and the mountains, heather clad, empty glens, with stags roaring. In short, a wild natural landscape. Now, the, this landscape can feel wild. However, I think it's true to say that to arrive at this picture, the landscape has been heavily influenced by the hand of man and in many places has been intensively managed. The management has largely been for hunting, shooting and sheep grazing. And one of the most notable management outcomes has been the prevalence of this tree, treeless bare landscape. So huge transformations occurred in the Scottish uplands during the 19th and early 20th century as the British Victorian shooting culture emerged. This culture, it held two species in particular in the highest regard, the red deer and the red grouse, with vast numbers of other species persecuted as vermin. You just have to look at the game book records of the big Highland estates to see how abundant the wildlife was at one time. All birds of prey, including golden and sea eagles, pine martens, wildcats, etc. They were all driven to extinction or close to it, with iconic species like the wolf having been wiped out earlier in the 18th century. And it was the promotion of habitat favourable for high red grouse populations, which necessitates regular heather burning. And this also acts to suppress and remove any young trees from regenerating. And as the desire to grow the number of sporting stags in an area increased, so did the overall deer herd numbers, which again, it results in more, well, it results in more grazing pressure on the land and inevitably those young trees get browsed out. But it, it, it's also fair to say it wasn't only shooting interests uh, that had an impact that led to overgrazing there was a seriously large scale boom in sheep, far sheep farming during the same period. And that, that was driven by the buoyant wool market at the time. And again, this you know, reduced availability of young, young woody shrubs and trees to grow. And over time, this has greatly diminished uh, the attempts of the trees to recover and regenerate. And they've all, you know, the, these woodland habitats were suppressed by hungry mouths and fire. So, so fast forwarding 150, 200 years, what do things look like in the, the Highlands today? Um, large parts of the Highlands, the uplands in Scotland, they're still dominated by sheep grazing, management of deer herds for stalking, and managed heather moorland for grouse shooting. Although the wool, wool industry, the demand there is no longer there to support the sheep grazing, uh, that industry is entirely propped up by taxpayer 
funded farm subsidy. 100% of upland sheep farms in Scotland would make a significant financial loss if it were not for uh, the annual farm subsidy payments, which, uh, as Roland set out, the rural funding is changing and where 100% of your business or 100% of that industry is relying on public subsidy uh, to survive. It's just not sustainable. In, rela in relation to the other two factors, there has been increasing pressure on land managers to reduce deer numbers, which are at record high levels, and also to carry out red grouse management in a more envi environmentally friendly manner. Um, and that includes uh, reducing uh, burning intensity and frequency, but also uh, taking a, a harder, firmer line and stopping the persecution of raptors. Uh, nonetheless, though, the, the Scottish government to date has been cautious in its approach and has generally gone down the route of consultations and rhetoric rather than putting in place any robust legislative measures. How, yeah, I would say, though, in the, in, the, in the past number of decades, there has been growing recognition for the desire and the need for conservation forming a larger part of land management objectives. The climate and biodiversity emergencies have both brought these issues into sharper focus in the past couple of years. And a big part of this movement is the desire, backed by the stated political aim of increasing forestry and woodland cover, which does form a foundation for much of the rewilding movement. So, as I said, large parts of the Highlands, the management is still based on an ideology developed in the Victorian era. It has been fashionable to have a shooting estate in the Highlands, and to a large extent, those estates which are still managed largely for the purposes of shooting stags or red grouse are only operated on, in that way to the desires of the landowners those landowners still want to shoot grouse every August or shoot stags every October. But there are clear signs that this ideology, this, uh, this cultural practice is becoming less fashionable and less dominant. And for example, the largest landowner in Scotland now, having overtaken the, the Duke of Buccleuch, is Anders Paulson, a Danish billionaire who, is buy, who owns and has bought and is buying vast areas of land in Scotland, primarily with a philanthropic objective of environmental restoration and community revival. If we take a look at Kilhone Estate here um, that I've got on the screen, Bidwell successfully sold this Highland Estate in 2000, 2019, just towards the tail end of last year. Now, Five to ten years ago, it would have been almost guaranteed that the buyer would have been motivated primarily by the prospect of good stag shooting. However, out of about 19 interested parties, only one of those was viewing the property as a sporting estate. Everyone else, including the successful purchaser, had conservation, rewilding and or natural capital enhancement in mind, which for rural uh, professionals, investors and advisors, it begs an interesting question as to how we go about actually placing a value on properties like this going forward. Currently and traditionally, the assessment of value has largely been on the sporting interest, i.e. the number of good sporting stags that could be shot per annum. And just, just moving on, just to keep some momentum going, what else have we been doing? What have Bidwell's been doing uh, in this field? In addition to selling and uh, buying places like Calhoun for clients, we've been involved for uh, decades in uh, large-scale habitat restoration projects before rewilding was fashionable. Um, this has largely been in relation to the restoration of the Caledonian pine woods, working to regenerate and expand these native woodlands that are remnants from the last ice age. This has been for a, a variety of clients, including traditional estates. And in the example shown here in the, in the image on the screen, this was uh, working with Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto Alcan 
prior to its sale to Jamaha Highland Estates, who own and operate the aluminium smelter in Fort William, which uh, that enterprise, it comes with vast areas of land surrounding Ben Nevis. And last year, the client with Bidwells uh, was recognised for all it has done in the restoration of these woods uh, by winning the, the Scotland's Finest Woods Award for New Native Woodlands on this Kinloch Leven project. So there are, there are you know, the, we have been active in this area for, for quite some time and, and the concept of rewilding and, and, and preservation or restoration and ha has been happening. But I, I, want to, I want to finish up with a, a, a brief look at what the opportunities may look like ahead of us. My view is that the future for ideas like rewilding, like habitat restoration and ecologically minded management is very positive. As Roland set out earlier, there is a growing marketplace for carbon and natural capital. Individual landowners and society in general certainly do appear to be placing more and more emphasis on the need for action in relation to the climate and biodiversity emergencies. In relation to trees, there is currently a buoyant market and government-backed desire in Scotland for creating new woodlands. And again, what have Bidwell's been doing? Well, last year, again, towards the tail end of last year, we, we, we purchased a uh, around 1,000 hectare sheep farm to plant with trees to convert and create a new woodland. Now, the client here is a, is a long-term forestry investor. It's a pension fund with whom we have a long-term relationship. But one of the, the major in, uh, investment drivers for them to get into new woodland creation was the recognition of the, you know, the strong ESG credentials that forestry as an asset class has and also an acknowledgement of the carbon that this new woodland would sequester. Um, taking a broader view than, than just trees, which can sometimes be difficult for a forester, um, <laughs> there are also great opportunities to change or adapt management practices to benefit other important habitats. The high, the high deer and sheep numbers uh, and, and, and drainage historically have led to significant deterioration and degradation of large areas of peat bog in Scotland. Now, taking measures to manage these peat bogs in a positive fashion will greatly enhance their natural capital value as these bogs are uh, less grazing, so they're more able to soak up and lock away carbon and filter clean, fresh drinking water, both of which are outcomes that society places a high value on. And if and when these types of natural capital products are monetized or commoditized, and as Roland touched on, I mean in a more wide ranging sense than isolated offsetting schemes, then if they are monetized and commoditized, and I'm not quite sure yet how we get there, but if we do get there, then this really would turn the, the economic and environmental landscape of the uplands on its head. If a Highland estate was valued on its natural capital, including its potentially enhanced natural, to, natural capital by implementing more restorative management practices rather than, rather than its shooting or sheep grazing value, then I'm hypothesizing that there will be huge influxes of capital to take advantage of this, uh, you know, this potential increasing at valuable asset. Um, this would not just be from the, the philanthropic billionaires, but there could be great opportunities from green finance initiatives, unitized funds and family offices. And as society advances, I'm proposing that it will value these natural capital products in ever greater regard as time goes on and resources around the planet and at home are squeezed by our ever-growing population and uh, changing climate. And bringing it back to to uh, the south south of the UK, where I know a lot of our, um, our audience are today, I don't think there will be a huge concern for where this, where this money comes from, if it's from the city of London, uh, from in, in investment vehicles uh, 
in England rather than Scotland. The fact is that the, due to the, the wider public benefit outcomes being delivered, the, the net gain and the positive view that I think the wider population will take on this, like they have been taking to uh, those philanthropic landowners that are now the largest landowners in Scotland, I don't think there's a cause for concern there. I, th I think there's great opportunity. So just to finish off uh, with my, sort of my final thought, um, is that rewilding or this landscape scale restora restoration and the ecological revival projects, they will and they, I think they probably do have to form part of the solution um, that, we're, that we're looking for in this green, green recovery and green economy. And the value, of, the value of these natural capital climate change fighting assets uh, could be tremendous. And I think there's an abundance of opportunities out there in, in, the, in the uplands, in North England and in, in Scotland to really uh, do some great things on this and capitalise on this as things go forward. So over to you, Giles, ready to take some questions. Andy, thank you. That was great. And I have to say, looking out of my window at um, rather flat and dull Suffolk, to see some of your photos of the Highlands of Scotland is far better and far more interesting than that. Yeah. Um, I was going to start with the first question on, on forestry north of the border. Yeah. You've talked about those who are already rewilding. Do they fall into any particular category? Are they the institutions? Are they people like Anders Paulson, the, the overseas investors and the overseas people who are interested in Scotland? Or are they what you might call your traditional Scottish landowners? And how do you think that'll sort of play out south of the border? Who, who's going to be the investors? Yeah, yeah. I think there's, um, there has been quite a, quite a mix um, of, of who is currently currently investing or doing these sorts of projects. There, there has been uh, the, 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 the large scale philanthropic uh, landowners who are, are you know, able and willing to plow in huge amounts of money. But we are, we are seeing uh, traditional estates and, and, and these, uh, these estates might be known for the by the families for hundreds of years. They, they're used to taking that really long term view and, and, and where they have the ability and they're able to, in areas on their property, to enhance the biodiversity, they are starting to, you know, to take different viewpoints. And a lot of the projects we have been working on historically have been related to traditional estates rather than new investors. In, t in terms of where the new investment is going to come from, uh, we work with a lot of forestry investment clients. And in the past couple of years, where it, you know it was always on the periphery, the discussion around carbon. It's very much at the forefront, and this is this is even before uh, there's a, a fully open, unrestricted carbon market in the UK. Currently, it's a pretty uh, cumbersome, uh, small component focused on a, a very small area of the of the woodland and forestry arena, but these institutional investors are asking the questions, how much carbon will this soak up? And at the moment, they might not necessarily be able to register that for offsets or, or monetize it. But for a lot of the big institutions, uh, they can still, we, can, we, we are still telling them how much carbon is in there or how much carbon to the best of our, you know, the best research that's out there is within their woodland and, and that is of great value to them uh, for their, their own PR, their, their ESG reporting, even though they may not be able to formally offset some emissions from industry. But it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely something that's up there on their interest radar. And Roland, south of the border, same answer or similar answer into who's going to lead this, who's going to, to really take natural capital forward? Roland, sorry, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Um, so, well, in terms of public funding, clearly that's going to be of great importance to the entire farming sector, uh, you know, land occupiers generally. Um, whereas I think these private markets, you know, some individuals will be very well placed uh, as a consequence of the location of their land um, and simply have those opportunities presented to them in, in a not dissimilar way to, you know, for example, solar, where at the moment, 
um, you know, the opportunity to pursue a solar development will depend on the availability of uh, grid capacity locally, typically. Um, and, and similarly, as I say, with biodiversity net gain, uh, we'll, we'll see certain land uh, with greater potential. Um, I think as far as speculative investment goes, as I say, I think the institutions will lead that. Um, there, there again will be big private estates that are already well placed uh, to deliver it. But, but as I say, we've started some early conversations with large institutions uh, who are, um, you know, long-standing landowners. They're very familiar with it. They know uh, what the risks and, and challenges of land ownership are. And, and to the extent that we're then able to demonstrate to them that there's a new source of revenue that they can exploit, uh, and then that's a credible uh, investment proposition, you know, there's investments there to be made and, and they've all got capital to place. They're all, um, you know, they've all got yeah, pretty significant appetite for, for further investment if, if the returns are there. Great, thanks Roland. And another question from Sean Dudley, thanks Sean, which I think is really interesting and something which we will all need to consider. What will happen to land use de designation? So if you add biodiversity both south of the border and north of the border, if you have rewilding, if you have natural capital, is this still going to be agricultural land? So if I turn to Andy first, what happens north of the border? Yeah, it's, well, I think it is a really good question. And I think um, a lot of people who have been involved in the, the, the land management sphere in Scotland for a, for a long time have sort of been crying out for a coherent overall land use strategy that brings together you know all all these different types of land uses and um i'm not sure we're quite there yet uh, the the there is a new planning framework coming out from scottish government which is trying to to try and tie up everything with climate changes is the major theme of of the new policy uh, so so there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of um, tying up and connecting between the, the various people that you inevitably, or the various bodies that you inevitably have to consult with to try and deliver what seems like a good thing on that site to, to you and many other people, but uh, to one particular organisation or stakeholder is not quite uh, tying up with their view on life. And, and without that overarching, really coherent uh, policy framework, it, it, it can prove challenging. And Rowan, south of the border, when you've um, uh, rewilded your Cambridgeshire fen, is it still agricultural land? Um, yeah, well, a co couple of things. I have actually tried typing a couple of answers to some of these questions, so I don't know if people see that in, in some of those boxes, but they were disappearing off the page as I was doing it, so I'm not sure whether those are visible. But, um, I mean, if first thing really, rewilding as a concept, difficult one um, I mean <laughs> conservation in in lots of parts of the world uh, you know seeks to preserve what ecologists would call climax communities i.e you know land the way God intended it with minimal human intervention um, conservation in this country tends to focus on um, what ecologists call plagio climaxes like a, a you know hay meadow that requires very significant ongoing active management in order to maintain its um, you know, characteristics, features of, of environmental importance. So, yeah, rewilding, yeah, as I say, I mean, you know, we're not likely to be rewilding much of Cambridgeshire is, is the truth of it, um, in, in any real sense. Um, but going to the, the question of, of status of land, clearly you need to be paid uh, sufficiently to justify the loss of flexibility in the long term. Now, that loss of flexibility may be anything from uh, you know, national designation as a triple SI if you really do achieve some, you know, super high quality habitat. Um, you know, probably not so likely um, unless you really do do something meaningful. You know, the private market commitments are long term and so that's entirely possible. Through public markets, you're not really likely to achieve anything in a 10 year period that's going to bring about a, a national designation. Um, you know, there's anything from that then to um, environmental impact assessment, agricultural regulations, which might prevent you from you know, converting what you've created as, as species rich grassland back into, um, you know, ploughed, um, you know, cultivation or, or indeed pursuing high value uh, development. But again, you know, all you may be doing is they're not effectively offsetting the offset. But, but again, I just come back to it. It really is about being paid sufficiently at the outset to uh, compensate you for any loss of flexibility you might face in the long term. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Another question here, um, 
many Scottish estates are massive, they're absolutely huge scale and they can really deliver landscape scale schemes, but a lot of them may be smaller. So do you think there's any benefit, firstly to Andy, north of the border, of estates, smaller estates joining up and then similar to Roland, do you think we'll get farmers joining up to deliver landscape corridors, biodiversity corridors or so on? So Andy first. Yeah, um, I think there's two, th two things I'd like to say on that. The, the, the first one is back to the, the stakeholders that you're engaging with to deliver these, they get very excited about landowner collaboration. It always ticks lots of boxes. Um, so it's definitely doable if you've got like-minded landowners. And the second part of that answer is uh, if, you, if you Google uh, Cairngorm Connect, it's uh, an alliance between Wild Land, which is Anders Poulsen, the Danish billionaire, uh, Forestry and Land Scotland, which is our Forestry Commission. Uh, it's got the National Trust for Scotland, or National, the National Trust at Mar Lodge, and who else? RSPB. In, in the Cairngorms, but around Aviemore, they have got a huge area that's all connected, that, that they all manage. And, they, they, they've got European funding now as well to try and turbocharge some of their conservation efforts. And, and that is, uh, you know, that's, that's all focused on creating this huge, huge corridor or huge area of conservation. And it, it's obviously very helpful that they're all fairly well aligned uh, landowners to deliver that. Um, but, you know, that's, that's going to... That, I think they, they reckon it's one of the largest contiguous areas now in Europe where there's a conservation management principle. Rowan, same principle in UK or England? Yeah, so I mean, clearly it is, yes, yeah, it's, it's a really important part of conservation. Uh, laws and principles, yeah, bigger, better, more joined up. And uh, it's a big focus of the public scheme. So the ELM scheme, I mentioned earlier, the third tier, which you know will be based around landowner collaboration and landscape scale delivery. Uh, but it's also a core part of the environment bill where nature recovery strategies serve exactly that purpose, identifying, and it won't necessarily mean uh, individual landowners collaborating, but at least uh, there will be some strategic planning as far as conservation resource, you know, the direction of conservation resource. So, you know, identifying how you can go about joining up, um, you know, what are currently fragmented uh, parcels of habitat. Um, so yes, I mean, ultimately you're achieving the same end goal and, and, and equally there will be that degree. So nature recovery networks will also then inform uh, the distribution of public funds through the ELM scheme uh, is, is the idea such that, you know, those local under the second tier that I mentioned um, where landowners pay for outputs, uh, again, they're not necessarily having to collaborate, but um, the, the discretionary distribution of those public funds will be informed by this uh, undertaken by that point effectively in, in identifying to deliver those environmental goods so yeah, it's not before time having a having a bit of strategic thinking around yeah, uh, and as you know as well as i know we're already seeing it around cambridge um with the best camps north and wildlife trust they are actually strategically thinking that way and approaching landowners um, a question which I think is an interesting one from Julie Robinson. Um, the question about agricultural land status may have capital tax implications too. Well, Julie, I think you're assuming that agricultural land will continue to get preferential tax treatment, which personally, I'm sorry, I don't believe it anymore. But if we are changing away from agricultural land status, Roland, Andy, do you think we're, we're, we're losing the same thing? I'll yeah. take that. Oh, all right. Sorry, no, go ahead. <laughs> all right. Go on. Okay, well, uh, not being a tax expert, um, just to caveat my answer here, the the um, trees are treated trees are treated differently, you know, in the tax regime as well, and there are some tax efficiencies there. So if you are creating more woodlands, um, primarily commercial, but uh, there can be very varying levels of commerciality to forestry and to woodlands, there could be other opportunities moving away from agriculture uh, still to 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 have some. Um, tax efficiencies there through the, 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 the owning of timber. England, Roland? Yeah, so really relevant question um, and a key consideration for any landowners considering uh, entering uh, or, you know, offering 
um, private goods, so through biodiversity net gain, for example, public goods, I think, you know, that will be construed, you know, considered as, as current schemes already are as, as a trade effectively, you know, the collection of, of public money for the delivery of those public goods. So I don't think the status in that sense will change. But, you know, in the same way as we can um, manage um, operational risk through the use of, for example, contract farming agreements. So, you know, a landowner may not themselves be driving a tractor and, or even owning a tractor or employing staff, yet can still be seen to be trading on the land. Um, you know, there are, there are equally ways that you can deliver environmental goods uh, and structure it in such a way as to maintain the trading status of that, um, you know, landowning, occupying entity, uh, whatever that might be. So yeah, key consideration, but can be overcome. Good, thank you. Fun question before we leave it, we do try and finish these at four o'clock on the dot. So from Joe at Hunters, thanks Joe. Is there any concept yet as to how elms will bind land? And I presume that means when you're transferring land from one owner to the next, will elms be uh, part of that transfer or have to be part of that transfer? Me, I assume. I'm hoping you, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so not not to my knowledge, but my expectation and belief is that it won't be too dissimilar from the current regime in that, uh, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of talk, you know, big push from DEFRA for, for simplification, um, you know, in terms of the admin burden that comes with, you know, participating in these schemes. Uh, they're talking about monthly payments rather than uh, biannual or, or annual payments to aid to cash flow. Um, I, I, I suspect that, you know, some elements will be the... Um, you know, non-discretionary, open to everybody, the tier one sort of things will be very similar to ELS insofar as you take your money and as long as you keep delivering, uh, you get to keep it. And in certain circumstances, um, you know, for certain options, if you if you cease to deliver them, which I think you will have the option to do, um, you know, for example, if you want to pursue a sale and the purchaser doesn't want to take on the commitment, um, you will simply have to pay back what you've already collected. Uh, or, or at least a portion of it. I think that will be the case for the vast majority of options. There may possibly be some where longer term commitments are required, where there's very significant capital investment. Um, and, you know, we may see more similar forms of agreement uh, for those landscape scale habitat restoration projects, for instance, uh, that we are, you know, that we put in place for, for biodiversity net gain, for example, like section 106 type commitments where that, you know there is a greater scope for a public body uh, to come and enforce that but uh, you know conservation covenants is the other principle that um, is introduced by the environment bill where effectively um, you know there is some suggestion that you know small conservation bodies other conservation charities can accept the benefit of those conservation covenants so private landowners effectively are, are making a, a you know positive commitment to deliver a certain form of management that can then be policed by um, you know, a, a conservation charity who can, who can enforce that against them if they're not uh, complying. So, so yeah, a range of options, but, but that in itself has its difficulties. So it's watch this space, but we will find out in due course what's going to happen, but likely to be similar to what's gone, gone in the past. Yep. Yeah. Andy, Roland, thank you very much indeed for all the hard work you've put into preparing for the presentations. Um, th these are very interesting things to do because you get absolutely no feedback whatsoever from your audience. So thanks to the audience for asking questions. Really, really helpful. It's great to have some interaction with you. We hope you've enjoyed it. I think for the first time in any webinar I've done, I have learned a new word, plagioclimax. I've never heard of that before. So thank you, Rowan, for teaching me my English as well. You knew that one, Andy, didn't you? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's all my time up here. <laughs> So we'd love to do another one of these. Please give us some feedback, positive, negative. We want your feedback as to how it's gone, whether you've enjoyed it, whether you've learned something. And we'd love some ideas as to subjects to talk about next time round. So we'll do another one in three or four weeks time. But thank you very much indeed for listening and goodbye. <laughs>